Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Carter Malloy, who's the founder and CEO of AcreTrader. AcreTrader was created with a simple mission to provide investors direct access to the highly attractive asset class of farmland. Farmland, right? In this episode, we talk about why farmland, why now, risks to farmland in general, thinking about lab-grown meat or aeroponics, as well as an in-depth interview on the types of properties AcreTrader has available to investors on their platforms. I really enjoyed this conversation about farmland investing in general. This has been something on my radar for a long time, and AcreTrader appears to be a sort of platform that allows you to invest in these highly attractive investment offerings in a bite-sized manner. And we talk about the potential asymmetric risk-reward opportunities that perhaps exist in U.S. farmland. Don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast anywhere you digest podcasts. This really, really helps. Either way, please enjoy this conversation with Carter Malloy. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here with Carter Malloy, who's the founder and CEO of Acre Trader, which is a farmland investment platform. Carter, really excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Ben. Looking forward to it. So I'd, I'd like to start off today just with a little bit of your background. Where are you from? What do you do? So I live here in Arkansas, which is where I, I grew up in a, in a farming family. Uh, I went to school a little over 20 years ago, did my undergrad in, in physics, and then spent a dozen years in uh, equity investing. Uh, so most most recently, I'm part of an equity investment firm in San Francisco uh, doing long, short uh, equity investing. And, and you know, I, I think the underlying uh, principle of, of a large part of my career in, in investing was always looking for asymmetric, asymmetric risk reward characteristics of any individual investment and, and doing a lot of work there uh, to, to make those decisions. And uh, in the background, I've been buying and selling farmland. Uh, it's my, my dad's a farmer. And so it was always, always been around the asset. And uh, I think I'd, I probably didn't appreciate it as an asset until I was much older, uh, but you know, much more of a place to be uh, than, than something that actually could produce real financial returns. Uh, and, and had a, a string of, you know, good, good luck and good successes investing and buying and selling land and had a neighbor in San Francisco. It's like, Hey, I want to, I want to invest with you and thought, well, surely, you know, it's a $3 trillion asset. We'll, we'll go online and, uh, you know, find some way to invest in it. And you know, I was pretty shocked at, at the fact that there wasn't really a great way for people to, to get direct exposure to, to land. And, and thus really was the, the genesis of Acre Trader. Nice. And how long ago was that? Oh, uh, three years ago, probably when that conversation happened and, you know, two and a half years ago, give or take started, uh, really penciling it and thinking through it and, um, built it for a long time with, with a group of technologists and then officially launched it just a little over a year ago. Well, congrats. And for sure is, uh, it's a new world, right? Like, um, and, and especially it seems very time, uh, it's very relevant now. I mean, the equity markets are insane. We're recording this at the end of July. So having these this potential asymmetric risk return profile outside of the publicly traded markets, um, it's very interesting. So I want you to talk to me a little bit more about farmland. So it sounds like your background's in farmland, but why, why is farmland as an asset class something that would be invest, interesting for investors? You know, I, I think to to oversimplify it, and we can, we can certainly dig in, but if, if you look very big picture, uh, it's really about supply and demand. Uh, so we only have, we have a finite amount of land, right? They're, they're not making any more land. And and in the U.S., uh, that the amount of farmland we have shrinks every minute by three acres. So every single minute we lose three acres of farmland, uh, usually due to development. On the other side of that, uh, we have more and more mouths to feed every day as more people are born. And, and so, you know, again, overly simplistically, that's, that's a large driver of appreciation, of, of improvement in value of land. Uh, if, if we step back and think about how you, you know, as a financial asset, how do you make money from owning farmland? It's really two ways. Uh, one is the appreciation of the underlying land. And two is the cash income that the farmer pays you. So we, we are not out uh, driving tractors and, and harvesting fields. Uh, it is, is a very simple tenant landlord relationship where we own the land and rent that out to a tenant farmer. And, and he takes on the business and operational risks uh, and has really great years and some bad years in between. And, um, you know, but, but for us, it's, it's much more about stability of that uh, cash income generated every year. And the, the cash component is 
uh, better than than bonds, I'd say. You know, certainly better than what Treasuries are paying you today. It's it's not overly exciting. This is a pretty boring asset. Uh, but the other side of that is it's also very straightforward to to manage and operate. You know, it's not like a a commercial building where out uh, fixing toilets and broken pipes in the middle of the night. Uh, so there, there's a cash income, and then the appreciation income has tended to be the uh, a, a larger driver of financial returns over history. And and those two things together have uh, driven for the last almost 30 years uh, about a 11 and a half uh, or a little more percent annual return to those investors on a, on a compounded basis. Uh, that's unlevered. And, and that's what's really incredible, right? Is, is that's, that's not using debt to amplify your returns. And, and because you don't use that debt, you, you don't see the, the large price swings that you see in, in say equity markets or, or you know, most major asset classes. So that's really what's fascinating to me is uh, farmland is an, is an absolute, uh, has been an absolute return generator, uh, one that competes with some of the best asset classes in the world, uh, but it's done so with far less volatility and, and price swings than a lot of the other asset classes. So, you know, gold as an example is seen as a premier inflation hedge and, uh, and a hedge in times of uncertainty like this. But the reality is, is there are years where gold loses 30% or more in value in a single year. Uh, we we have not seen anything remotely like that uh, in the world of farmland. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that there were like three down years in farmland in the past 50 years or something. I mean, it's very consistent. Hey, 11.5% sounds great to me. So uh, this 11.5%, a portion is driven by the land value increasing and a portion is driven by the cash rent from the par farmer. And it sounds like the way that you're doing it is you're not exposed to any of these, you know, if there's a drought and the crops uh, plummet, but there's a bit of risk there that the farmer won't be able to pay the rent, right? Is this something, what are the key risks for you when you're looking at investing in farmland? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, stick to speaking to row crops for, for the time being, and then I want to expand the conversation to permanent crops, things like trees that, that grow fruit and nuts, because that's it's an added layer of complexity. Uh, so uh, for, for the purposes of, of that question, um, you know, the, the tenant pays us rent usually in advance. Uh, so they, they pay rent often a cash rent in March before they even plant. Uh, and so as a result, you see default, default uh, and vacancy rates both incredibly low in, in farmland. And there, there's not a lot of great official data around it, um, but I, I can tell you qualitatively, we've never had a tenant default. Um, you know, last year we had one tenant retire and we're able to find a replacement tenant within five days, give or take. It, it's, you know, not to say there's, there's not risks. I, I certainly want to dive into those. Um, but, but as a whole, in, in dealing with the tenants, uh, it seems to be relatively uh, lower risk than, than a lot of, uh, you know, things like renting every month in, in a retail center, for example, where your tenant can just be late and then you got to kick them out and then you're left with a big hole. So very, very different profile uh, than that. I, I'd say that there are material risks in underwriting in, in an acquiring, just, just as there is with, with any real estate or any, any hard asset for that matter. Um, you know, doing real diligence on the soils, on the water, uh, on the financial profile of that piece of land are, are, are really important. And, and that's something where uh, we we are incredibly proud of the team we have, uh, the experience on that team and the, the acquisitions we've done to date. Yeah, that makes sense. Perhaps it might be beneficial to back up a little bit because you mentioned a few things like row crops. Investing in farmland, maybe if you could just zoom out and what exactly is farmland? Because it sounds like a real estate investment very similar. You have a tenant paying paying rent. So maybe the different types of farmland and what this means. Farmland to us means uh, land you grow things on, right? There, there is pasture land where you grow grass to feed cows. That's, that's not really something we, we do. There's timber land where you grow trees for uh, paper and wood, things like that. Um, so, you know, there's ranches, uh, there's, there's uh, swamps, there's all kinds of land. But, but farmland in, in the way that we identify and, and look at it is, is really productive land, land with good soil and, and good water that could grow crops. Uh, we split that world into two, uh, which is row crops and permanent crops. And, and it's a little bit of an oversimplification, um, but for a row crop, that's a, a piece of land where you rent it out to a farmer that comes in each year and, and plants something new, corn, soybeans, rice, sorghum, peanuts, melons, things like that. 
permanent crops uh, are, are a little different in their financial profile in that uh, you, you not only own the land, but you own the trees as well. Right? So the trees have real value and the, and the value can actually, uh, or it does depreciate over time because they have a, a useful life. Uh, but with permanent crops, uh, so we're talking about things like apples and, and walnuts and pecans, uh, where, where you do own the trees as well, uh, the appreciation factor uh, seems to be a little lower than it does for row crops. Uh, because while, while the land is going up in value, your trees over, you know, whether it's a 20 or 50 or 80 year lifespan, they do decrease in value over time. However, those trees produce something and, uh, and that something uh, usually has a higher cash flow component than, than row crops. So on row crops where your gross cash yields uh, today, they're probably like two and a half to four, four and a half percent. Uh, with, with permanent crops, that can be as high as six to nine uh, percent. Th then again, you have the appreciation component for, for each on top uh, for your total return that ends up being fairly similar between the two assets. Uh, but with, with permanent crops, basically, you get more cash now, is the best way to put it. Gotcha. And with Acre Trader, you focus on which ones? Both. Um, so we, uh, it, it, as, a, as a general statement, permanent crops tend to be on the West Coast and row crops tend to be in the middle. Uh, we, we do have uh, plenty of nut trees uh, in the middle as well. So it's, a, it's an oversimplification. But uh, as an example, uh, almonds, 80, almost 80% of the entire world's almond supply comes from California, from, from one place. That's wild. It, it That's is. wild. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a crop we're fascinated by and, and pretty bullish on. Uh, long term, and and one that we're actually uh, launching another deal on, uh, hopefully next week. Nice. Well, with the rise of this ketogenic diet, you know, people got to get their almond milk. So I get it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> you touched briefly on return profile, less correlated to a number of publicly traded assets. You compared it a little bit to gold. How does uh, investing in farmland compare to a real estate portfolio? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, in terms of correlation, I want to touch that first. You, you brought up a great word. Co correlation being uh, how one thing influences the other, right? Um, and, and so there are correlations all among the markets of, of various uh, uh, investments and assets moving in tandem with each other or, or near tandem. Um, it, it's a really fascinating thing about farmland is it has no meaningful correlation to any major asset that, that we can see. Uh, and, and so it's sort of its own thing that does its own you know, acts on its own. Um, to compare that to your, to your other part of your question, to compare it with, with real estate, uh, the return profile is fairly similar uh, for the last give or take 30 years, um, which I, I use that time frame as it's sort of the maximum we have of really good data for, for measuring farmland investment performance. Um, but, but over that time period, uh, the, the return profiles are very similar. Uh, the uh, the, the change in that return profile is what's, what's different, right? So, so if you own commercial real estate today, you're in a, often in a really bad place. If you owned commercial real estate or residential real estate in 08, 09, it was a really, really tough time. Uh, and, and not only was it tough because the asset prices were moving and because the vacancy rates were going up, defaults were going up, so you weren't getting your cash, but more often than not, it's also a levered asset. Right, so you, you've got debt on that, and and if you think about a, a typical capital stack, uh, let's let's use a an office building as an example. Uh, those will often be financed seventy five percent debt and and twenty five percent equity uh, or cash that the investors put in. And for that office building, uh, if you see a twenty five percent correction in price, uh, which is not unheard of, then you're wiped out. I mean, assuming you know if you can. If you can make the payments, great. Um, but uh, if you see a 25% correction in price and the, the bank calls you, uh, you've, you've lost all your money. And, and that's, uh, that's scary. You know? and, and, and so when we talk about the, the two assets and, and how they look different, uh, the return profiles uh, you know, look, look pretty different. Uh, or, sorry, the return profiles look same, the same or, or similar. Uh, the, the volatility and movements in, in price look very different. But when you zoom in and look at individual assets, uh, it's even more radical uh, because uh, some commercial real estate has bad years uh, and good and great years, I, I should say, right? It's, it's not that it's a bad asset class. I'm I personally you know, own, own commercial real estate. We're not, we're not preaching against it. Um, but there are also some years and some assets and commercial where you lose it all. 
and and uh, we're certainly experiencing a lot of that. You know, we'll see a lot of how that shakes out here in the next six months, uh, but it's it definitely feels scary. Definitely, and I think a lot of that presumably is due to the longer holding times and just more consistent. I mean, you don't have these retailers that are coming and going. It's more of somebody feeding mouths. So the demand is pretty constant or like you said, increasing. Um, but perhaps I, I think you touched on a few good points about liquidity. I mean, I read some places that farmland traditionally is passed on from generation to ger generation. So sometimes these this land just won't sell for an entire generation. So it sounds like liquidity is very constrained within the farmland investing space. Is that accurate? It is. On a relative basis, it trades hands far less often than a, uh, say, a commercial building would. Um, but that's not to say there isn't liquidity uh, on a you know percent of the total asset base there, there's less turnover um, but if you if you think about us farmlands three trillion dollars of value roughly uh, globally it's nine uh, but in the us it, while it's again relatively as a percent of the total asset less of it turns over we still see something like 50 or 100 billion dollars of farmland that's bought and sold every year uh, so so there is there is real trading out there of, of land and and real establishment of values and comparable sales and things like that. Okay. And I want you to talk to me a little bit about the type of investors that are currently investing in farmland, the type that should be invested in farmland. I mean, 11 and percent super consistent returns. It seems like this would be something that a lot of people would be bullish on. And I, I know like Jim Rogers and a few others have been pounding the table for years about investing in farmland, but is this something they're starting to be more institutional interest? And then obviously platforms like AcreTrader, democratizing investment, making it easier for somebody like me to invest. Maybe just talk about uh, investor profiles interested in investing something like asset, uh, farmland. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll touch on institutional and then I'll come back to uh, our, our platform and sort of profiles that we see. So from an institutional standpoint, uh, today there's about 30 billion of private equity money in, in farmland that, that we can see. Uh, that's up from about 3 billion 10 years ago. So pretty uh, stratospheric growth, right? It's, it's a, a lot of, uh, on, a, on a growth basis, it's a lot of asset gathering. On, on an absolute what is that basis, as a percentage of total, though? I mean, that's that's yeah, exactly where I was going. Great, great question. <laughs> uh, no, 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 man, that's awesome. Uh, so that's still only one percent of the asset, right? So, in, in terms of uh, capital formation and professionalization of the asset class, we're still wildly immature. Uh, to me, that's really exciting because uh, it, it, it suggests, and, and it certainly is, is the reality that there is real information asymmetry in farmland investing. Uh, and, and that can be a huge advantage. You know, just as there was um, in public markets investing 50 years ago, let's say, um, you know, and uh, yeah, in, in most markets early on when there's a information asymmetry, you really see uh, some investing outperforming uh, on, on a relative basis. And, and that's certainly our, our hope as well. Uh, for, for our website, and I'm gonna dovetail over to the, the investor profiles that we see, but on the website, um, you know, when we discuss returns, we just simply use more or less uh, today's cash return plus a, a, an average appreciation. So we don't engage in, th you know, in, in uh, a lot of like mark to market type of uh, work uh, to, to make it look better than it's going to be. Uh, you know, our, our hope is to outperform what we, what we see on our website. Uh, but, but again, we'd just rather be, be conservative in our underwriting and approach. Um, the, the types of investors that come to our website, and, and you've highlighted something that's interesting, is there, there, are, there are investors and there are traders, right? And we are after the former, uh, you know, the people we would like to work with, ideally. Uh, pe you know, and, and the reality is, if you are good at trading, uh, you could make incredible amounts of money in equity markets and gold and commercial real estate. And some people are. And, and they're, they're wildly successful at that. And I, I applaud those efforts. Um, that's not what we're after. You know, I, I think the, the data would show that over your, your lifetime, uh, trading is not as effective as compounding. 
and and that compounding of wealth is or compounding of capital is what we're really after uh, is is uh, slow and steady wins the race right it's the best way to put that and and we do see that a lot with with our investor profiles so the the, the people we work with um, are their investors on our platform they tend to be repeat investors they they come on multiple times and invest in multiple deals with us um, a, a lot of those will just hit the minimum every time you know if it's 10 or 20 or thirty thousand dollars they'll put that into each deal uh, some are more like family office type type investors that'll uh, certainly be putting in much more and tend to be a little more selective and and which assets they, they invest in. Um, but, but as a whole, that's who we would like to align ourselves with is, is investors, not traders. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you touched on a very interesting point. So uh, investments in farmland went from 3 billion to 30 billion, which is 1%. So it was at 0.1% was held by institutional investors. That number is insanely small. Why do you think institutional interest was so low, say 10 years ago? And what, what sort of institutional investors are going into this now? And do you, obviously you see this trend continuing because it's just from a low base, but where do you, where do you see this going? Uh, what kind of institutional investors are interested in this? You know, for, for institutional investors, uh, when you think about the, the LPs, the limited partners that, that put money into these funds, uh, they, they tend to be very long-term. It's endowments, uh, you know, universities and pension plans and uh, churches and hospitals and schools, th things like that. Uh, you know, they really, you know, probably more than anyone, focus on portfolio diversification. And, and generating outsized returns over time uh, and, and, and attractive risk-adjusted returns, right? There's a, a sharp ratio is what, what everybody in the industry tends to chase, uh, which is your, your CFA. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, you, you know way more about this than I do. Um, I, I always said I was smart enough to know I'm too dumb to, to pass CFA tests. Uh, I was too but, dumb to realize <laughs> that I shouldn't have stopped, I should have <laughs> stopped taking them. <laughs> um, but that you know the the institutional investors that uh, that are they're putting money into these these private equity funds uh, tend to like that long term diversity of farmland. I, I think quite frankly, just the the data and the awareness of it has has only been growing here in the last decade off off of what you mentioned was an incredibly low base. Uh, and And so we we think that will continue, and we think that will continue to support farmland prices. Um, you know what what we don't want is a bunch of speculation going on and uh, you know, maybe there's a few pockets in, in uh, Iowa as an example where that may be happening, but, but as a whole, I uh, don't, don't see much of that out there, which is, which is healthy. Um, but, you know, I, I think given the returns that have been generated thus far, I, I would expect to continue, see, continue to see asset gathering you know, within farmland. What interesting trends do you see within farming? So I would think over the last 10, 20 years, technology, you know, new seeds, higher crop yield, uh, new technologies, farming techniques, lower uh, human involvement in farming. All of these things, I think, would be bullish for farming in general. You know, the farmers themselves can make uh, better profits so they can pay you higher rents. Um, what, what kind of higher level trends do you see within farming? So it's a great question. Uh, we, we are seeing a, uh, you know, an explosion of, of ag tech uh, offerings and products out there. And, and frankly, it's, it's almost overwhelming for the farmers at this point because they're getting so many pitches for so many different tools. Uh, and, and there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Uh, you know, I think at, at the core, uh, you mentioned earlier, is, is seed genetics and, and continuing to, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hotly debated topic, but, but um, you know, whether you're doing that in a laboratory or breeding plants, uh, as we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years, uh, to make them more drone resistant, uh, you know, need less water, need less fertilizer, uh, be more kind to the soil. Uh, th those advancements in, in genetics are, are, are really helpful uh, to feed the world, uh, fr frankly, and to help, help us grow food uh, and, and to help the, the farmer's operations. Um, beyond, you know, that, that is sort of the core blocking and tackling that's been going on for, again, thousands and thousands of years and, and you know, has really uh, taken off in the last 50 years. Um, we're, we're seeing some really cool things uh, in the world of AI. 
uh, you know, it's still very early days, but, but uh, you know, just my own personal view is if we think out 10 or 20 years, what has the potential to have the most outsized impact? Uh, it's the application of, of machine learning on, on a farm. Um, you know, give, give you an example of that. Uh, my, my brother actually runs a company uh, that, that's, that's focused on uh, basically visualization and understanding uh, of your, your fields. So the way that that would typically work, well, historically, a, your, your seed salesman uh, is also your agronomist, right? So said differently, your doctor is your pharmacist. Uh, that's a really dangerous thing because, you know, when your doctor is the one writing you prescriptions and making money off those prescriptions, uh, he has a tendency to, he or she has a tendency to overprescribe. And so uh, a, an agronomist would come out and look at, look at, and I'm, I'm being overly generalist about this. There's some amazing seed companies and people out there, right? So I don't mean to insult by saying this, but uh, it is often the case where an agronomist comes out, takes a look at your field. It's 200 acres and says, oh, you know, I sampled it in four places and across this 200 acres, you need to apply X amount of nitrogen uh, to, to optimize your, your crop yield. But in fact, uh, across that 200 acres, your, your soil type, uh, how your water uh, lays or, or flows across the land, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are so many variables to take into account uh, that, that every acre, every meter for that matter, uh, may have a different growing profile than the one just next to it. And so now with um, a lot of the application technologies and, and improvements and in, in, uh, on-farm implements uh, to be able to, to actually manage your farm on a, on a per acre basis or, or smaller, uh, applying uh, data science really uh, to, to your fields and understanding this, this incredibly complex array of, of variables uh, that, that impact your, your growing conditions. Uh, this company in particular, Arva Intelligence, I'm speaking of, is just incredible what they're able to do and go out there and say, hey, actually, uh, you know, you could put half as much nitrogen over on that part of the farm uh, and do better, you know, and, and by the way, like have less runoff uh, and, and have, you know, obviously save money, uh, but, but do a better thing for the environment as well. And so I'm really, really excited about where that type of technology is headed over the next decade or two. I mean, uh, in incredible. The, the amount of things we can do with proper data now and these this this machine learning and all of these things, but it, ultimately we're going to look back and everything we're doing now is such a blunt in instrument, right? Like yeah. you need more nitrogen across the entire field. That's hundreds of acres. Of course, it's exactly the same across the entire thing. Uh, it's going to be the same thing with medicine, right? Like you mean I, I got my temperature check like three times a year and that's how I determined my healthiness <laughs> like it's yeah. just crazy but you know these things will become more and more apparent and, and technology is enabling us to get better with all of these so it's really um, yeah. really fun and, and your, your point of, of three times a year taking your temperature is a, a really important one which is we are only as good as the data we collect right like, there's no algorithm that can solve a problem if you give it three data points Exactly. Uh, or, or, you know, very, only very rudimentary problems, I should say. So uh, well, that's, or that's, it will solve it in the way that you don't want it to be solved because it's <laughs> right. certainly not enough data. Right. It, it, and that's a really great point with, with farmland technology as, as using uh, machine learning as an application. Uh, but, but data gathering is, is vital, you know, if not even more important. And, and we are seeing a, a real growth in that with uh, companies like Granular, for example, that are uh, helping you to, to gather on farm data. Uh, and then there's, there's a, a myriad of companies doing drone imagery and satellite imagery and, oh, yeah. and, and that, that visual data as well can, can be really informative uh, to oh, help yeah. uh, improve farming practices. Nice. Yeah. My, uh, I come from a long line of farmers. I'm obviously not, but um, grandparents, great grandparents, all were farmers. So the, the number of new technologies coming out would just make them their heads spin, I'm sure. So talking about those techno technological uh, breakthroughs within farming. I mean, I keep going back to risks because I think that's under, fully understanding the risks of any investment are very, very important. But I just think technology's improving and evolving this pretty old, simple asset class in many different ways. You can see a lot of these. Demand and supply drive these asset prices, obviously. Demand is going up with uh, food, more humans, population growth, that's obvious. Supplies constrained because they're not making any more land. 
but I wonder if you pick apart those two variables a little bit more. Supply, this is assuming that, you know, new land doesn't come online because of technology suddenly in an unfarmable place like, I don't know, say Ethiopia. Sure. And I have no idea. I'm just picking on them. Mm -hmm. But presumably the land is less farmable and lower cost. So suddenly, you know, if you can drive the operating cost down with technology, then food becomes suddenly cheaper to produce their export back to the U.S. So this becomes, a, you know, supply is actually increased in this case. Then I think of the other side of demand. So this is assuming that we continue eating the way that we eat now, and there's not some matrix-esque synthetic goo that has all of the <laughs> nutritional content that we need to eat that's produced in a lab at bulk. And this might be way too far, right? But are these some risks that you think through or these are just you know 20 plus years out so i'm going to hold this thing for 10 years and within that 10 year period i don't expect it to change too drastically it's a it's a great um uh, it, it's a really great question so on the supply side first um you know the the reality is is that the unfortunate reality i should say is that that incremental capacity growing capacity um, doesn't sit in a, in a desert somewhere. It sits underneath rainforests. And, and so uh, unfortunately, that's, that's where we're seeing more arable land be picked up uh, or in places you know, like, like um, uh, in Southeast Asia where there's wholesale uh, cut downs of forest to, to grow um, a palm oil. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the unfortunate uh, nature of where we are today is that there is such demand that we're making these um, horribly blind near-term decisions uh, to, to drive down price or, or to hold back inflationary pricing, I should say. And, um, you know, even with that, the arable land per capita, uh, you know, it still has some, some overall pressure and, and there's uh, plenty of data, sort of global data on that, uh, that, that shows that that, that trend, uh, that the pressure, that problem will persist for, for a long time. Uh, so, so on the supply side, um, I'm worried about where that, that supply of land comes from. Uh, but, but I'm in, in pure investment terms uh, in holding land, I am, I'm less concerned about that incremental supply pressuring us as investors on, on the demand side, uh, you, you, you know, the goo, if you will, the, the matrix goo, uh, while, while that's pretty far out, you know, I, I think, uh, I'll, I'll give you a great example where, uh, protein demand in Asia is, is soaring, right? There's, there's a growing middle class. And so they're, they're eating more and more meat. Uh, that meat requires a uh, material uh, uh, input of grain to, to grow. And, and so that is, that's helping drive uh, incremental demand uh, for, right, so right beyond just more people, more people are eating uh, more rich foods that require that much more uh, inputs. If, if, as you think about, uh, pressures to the other side of that. There are things um, coming along that, that are you know, exciting developments in technology and, and meatless technology. Um, you know where where we're using um, you know soy proteins and chickpeas to to make burgers that taste pretty pretty dang good. Uh, and and that you know over the over the long term uh, could actually replace some of our, our protein. Again, we will have more people to feed in twenty years than we do today. Uh, and at the end of the day, that burger is still made of things we grow on a farm. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think it comes down to how you model the curve of, of demand, uh, because there's, there's a lot of influential variables that, that drive that up or down. Uh, but the reality is, is that that thing still points up and to the right in, in terms of uh, excess demand. There's, there's a UN stat of, um, I'm going to botch it, uh, by 2030, we've got a, or, or 20, uh, dang. I don't have off the top of my head, but it, you know, there's, there's a 50% increase in food necessary over coming decades. Or 70. Uh, the, I think I read 70. Like that, it's that, insane. That's it. By 2050, it's 70%. Thank you. You know the stats better. Thank you. Uh, that's exactly. I did a little it's, research too. Sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, man. It's great. Uh, but, but point being like, do, do we really care if it's 30 or if it's 100? 
uh, right? E either way, uh, you're talking about a, a material increase in demand for the product that we create. Yeah, but the the, the com composition, these impossible burgers or, or um, the lab grown meat, yes, it's inputs are grown on a farm, but the amount of crops necessary to make that eight ounce hamburger versus make an eight, eight ounce lab grown burger are very different. So I, I would think the, the amount of land needed would change drastically, whether it's a plant-based or meat-based burger. But you're right, they're it, delicious either way, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I, you know, again, we're, we're exploring the, you know, I think ultimately that boils down to me of how bullish are you on increase of demand of food? Uh, as, as opposed to, you know, will we need food or not, right? Because it's, 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 it's certainly not binary. Like we, we need food, we will need to eat. Uh, we, will, we will continue to need to grow it. Right. And I mean, there's a million different risks, right? There's what, what percentage likelihood and, and time frame for that risk to play out. Uh, there's a lot of them. That was really helpful going through more on farmland. So we've talked a bit about Acre Trader. Perhaps if you could just give a much higher level like what makes Acre Trader unique? You have a couple competitors out there in the space. Why should an investor choose Acre Trader over over these other competitors? Sure, we want investors to look at everything out there, right? Beyond beyond competitors, there's there's private equity funds, there's REITs, uh, and you know I, I think that it's great that investors do real due diligence and and uh, speak with financial advisors and you know make make sure they're making a choice that's comparable with them. The way I would describe our team is. Um, uh, we're rednecks. It's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> you know, we, we are like actual farmers. We've got hundreds of millions of dollars of farmland management expertise on our team. We've got in incredibly intense uh, underwriting and due diligence that, that we do on these farms before we put them on the platform. You know, we, we select, it's, it's less than one in a hundred farms we look at that we decide, hey, this is actually something we're excited to invest in. And, uh, and, and it's maybe way less than one in a hundred. Uh, I can't tell you, you know, we have a, a very formalized uh, funnel or pipeline management system we've built it has three stages in it. And that, that third stage or, or phase three of, of diligence, even when we get a farm to that, which is like, all right, let's get in and dig in and get out there and see it and do some real uh, physical type of diligence uh, and you know, calling of all the tenants in the local area and doing channel checks, that, that type of work. Uh, we still kill the majority or extreme majority of those farms that we were excited about. While, while I can't speak to the, the broader landscape, what I, what I can speak to is what, what I'm most proud of at Acre Traders are people and, and the, the work that we all do. We all get in very early in the morning, we leave late at night, and we, we live, breathe, and eat farmland. Uh, and and that's, uh, yeah, that, that's really our big sticking point is, is that if, if you see something on our website, uh, you, you can be comfortable that we've done a, you know, an overwhelming amount of work there and we've turned away a huge amount of farms that on the surface probably looked very similar, uh, but, it, but in reality, we're, we're not. Awesome. Actually, so th th that sounds like a very important part, you, and you touch briefly on the due diligence process. What is the overall, I mean, where are you getting this deal flow from? Kind of walk me through from the, from the moment you identify this as an opportunity to the, the last moment that you know it's been vetted, thrown on your platform, what does this look like? So, um, you know, a, a lot, we'll talk about sourcing first and we'll, we'll sort of, you know, go a little more into uh, diligence, but uh, for, for sourcing, network matters, right? So we, we certainly, uh, each of us have a, a pretty extensive network in the world of, of farmland and that helps. Um, but beyond that, you know, we have, uh, we have a very formalized process of, of supply management, if you will. Uh, and, and so, our, and sourcing for that matter. So in sourcing, we're, we're working with hundreds and hundreds of, of brokers. Uh, we work with farmland funds, with bankers, with advisors, with farmland managers. Uh, and then we do a lot of direct marketing. So we actually go out and, and serve ads to farmers and, and farmland owners uh, to try to find off-market supply. Uh, and we, we um, you know, have a, uh, people on the phone all day, every day, uh, speaking with those leads and, and looking at those pieces of farmland. That's pretty unique, or, or I would say singularly unique uh, in, in our approach to that. And, and what that does is affords us the ability to uh, turn on the flippers more aggressively, to, to, to get rid of uh, the things that, that are uh, easier to know to. Uh, so we, we really boil it down to three things we look at on a farm. And I think I mentioned this earlier, which is water, 
soil and financial profile. And, and there, there are, it's in total like a 96 point checklist. It's a, there's a lot of sub bullet points to those three, uh, but that's, that's really what, what we boil it down to. And many of those things can be automated, right? So as, as an example, we've, we've got uh, data scrapers, you know, crawling the internet every day, looking for anything that may pop up. Uh, it's, I think it's well over a hundred thousand farms we, we have in that and, and then building uh, automated tools to not even, you know, allow us to look at the ones that, that don't fit our criteria. And, and then the, the ones that do, then moving them through this uh, three-phase diligence I was speaking to earlier. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, water, soil, and financial potential. What was the last one? Yeah. F- financial profile. So, so really profile. That, that's, um, you know, valuation, cap rate, uh, area, rent structures, comparable sales, uh, and, and a, a long list of items that, that would sort of feed into that catch-all of, of uh, is this actually a good investment? You know, beyond gotcha. is it, fu- is it fu- you know, the, the first two are fundamentally is this good land? Yeah. Uh, which, is, which is really important uh, because there's, give you an example, uh, the panhandle of Texas has some amazing looking cotton farms with really great cap rates and they're, they seem really cheap. Um, and and uh, so they, they, from the financial profile side, like they click off well. Uh, on the soil side, they've got great soils. Uh, then you go in and do well tests uh, in, a, in a specific area and you, you begin to realize how quickly uh, the underlying aquifer there is, is depleting. And you go, man, this is a great farm for the next 10 years or 20 years and this may be a desert. Uh, and, and that is obviously not, not and that, again, I don't mean to use, cast a, a blanket statement for the entire panhandle, uh, but, but there's a lot of uh, traps out there and, and value traps out there that, that can be really uh, dangerous for investors. This is a real risk, right? I mean, water is going to be a bigger and bigger struggle. And even, you know, you said something about almond farms in California. California has a huge water issue, you know, so I'm sure the cap rates on some of these places look fantastic because they're not going to have, well, they'll have access, but the price of water to get out to that farm will go up exponentially, which impacts the financial profile of this farm. So, That's right. uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a real estate investing, you know, it, you look at this broad brush and you say, oh, this cap rate is great. I should, I should invest here. And then you realize, you know, there's, there's shootings in the neighborhood every day and like evictions are served out left and right. And you're like, eh, there's a reason why there's such a high cap rate when everywhere else is, you know, next to nothing. Well, well said. Um, and, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, but it's, it's actually why we, uh, don't use the word crowdfunding a lot to describe our business. While we use a lot of the same rules and regulations, uh, I am I am very afraid of some of the deals that I've seen getting done in that space. And exactly to your point, um, you know, saw I've seen a few pop up in my hometown where, where I grew up. And on paper, they look awesome. And man, they've got some great, beautiful photos of the place. And uh, you know, from uh, Excel investing on on Excel spreadsheet, it looks amazing. Uh, but you know, you're like, man, that is in a really bad part of town or, oh my gosh, they're building a hundred million dollar development on the other side of the interstate uh, with two hotels going in. This hotel is not going to work. Uh, you know, that, that type of uh, concern oh, yeah. that's just, you know, really tough to get uh, w- without like on the ground understanding and, and local or hyper local uh, diligence. But as you said on Excel, I mean, it looks great on paper, right? So you touched on a good point about, boots on the ground, knowing the region that you're investing in. But it seems like you've touched on a number of different regions within the U.S. At AcreTrader, do you focus on a specific region? You touched on the type of of farmland, so it sounds like you're niching down a a little bit, but it sounds like it would be very difficult or very time intensive to search uh, nationwide and you, you guys are not global right it's strictly within the u.s and that's then talk correct. about the regions that you focus on so that's correct we're strictly u.s we like our title laws here a lot uh, and so that's that's where we are probably for for the foreseeable future uh, we are focused primarily in the mississippi river delta in the midwest and on the west coast uh, so that's that's the three regions in, in general uh, with, with some exceptions here and there um, but but it's it's a really good point, uh, and the answer is like you're you're right. It takes a it takes a lot of work to get to know these individual places, and we've we have um, 
you know, we have tons and tons of our own data, right? So uh, if you think about, you know, five of us making calls to, to farmers every day and speaking to local farm managers and people on the ground and people at a water office in a certain water district in California, uh, we actually, um, we, we professionalize those notes and, and have, have built this thing we call the farm knowledge database uh, that's proprietary. Uh, so that every time we look at a particular region, not only do we have maps and and every report, you know, so we go see a county and we'll go, all right, well, here's the the five different macro and micro reports that maybe the local university put out um, on, on land value trends or on the aquifer. Uh, but, but then beyond that, just all of this qualitative data we pick up and quantitative as well uh, over, over the years, we continuously uh, put that into a searchable database so that we're able to zoom in on a hyperlocal basis and, and scale that out internally. Uh, beyond that, it then still requires uh, very real manual due diligence. Um, and, and that's frankly like a, a, a dozen years of, of equity investing. Like that's the thing I always focused on was, hey, we like this sector. We like this stock. Now pick up the phone and just cold call 50 people, right? And and talk to people and actually understand what's, what's going on there uh, with that particular sector or business, or in this case, geography and, and tenant. Uh, and so uh, that uh, approach that line of thinking is, is very pervasive within our organization. Uh, and, and that's something that we, we really pride ourselves on is picking up the phone. And I, I know it sounds kind of silly, um, but, but it's, it's absolutely shocking, you know, the, the amount of spreadsheet farming that goes on as opposed to, you know, actual like, Hey, you know, explain to me this new type of uh, silt loam and uh, soil that we haven't seen this profile before and uh, getting down to the soil science in that particular case. Uh, or, or the salinity of this water seems to have some issues. Let's talk about the, the history of that and call the, the USGS, uh, talk to the geological survey about, about what's happening in that aquifer. Well, it's certainly not sexy, but especially for something like this, that there's not a lot of information. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, with stocks, it's very different. They're publicly traded. There's tons of people looking at everything that's pretty transparent, but with farmland, I would imagine it's oh so important to actually roll up your sleeves, do that dirty work, um, and it will show in the, the returns, hopefully. With Acre Trader, I mean, walk me through how many how many investments pop up on your platform, what the minimum is, you're for accredited investors only. Do you have any plans to roll this out to non-accredited? And then perhaps you know, what are your fees? How do you make money as a company, as an acre trader? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're correct. Right now we are accredited investors only. Uh, we, we may change that in the future. I think we would like to, uh, quite frankly, the, the idea was never, let's democratize this asset only for accredited investors, right? Uh, and so, uh, but, but the, the rules and regulations and, and expenses uh, associated with that uh, make it difficult. And, and for us, uh, a core tenant is is low fees. Uh, we we know. I mean, that, that, a that's just the way the world is going, uh, and and b we know if we offer low fee structures, then um, you know we will um, have more volume, and that's that's really the the goal for us. You know, if, if we think out on a five year time frame, it's it's improved transparency and liquidity within this asset class. Uh, so we charge the investors uh, pay our management company. 75 or 100 basis points a year, so 0.75 or, or 1% of, of the asset value. So that's certainly a lot lower than what you'd find in, in like a private equity type of structure or a REIT structure. Uh, and, and beyond that, we, don't, we do not charge a carried interest. So, uh, so really just a, a baseline asset management fee. And then we have a wholly owned real estate brokerage uh, that takes place and that's, that takes part in the, the real estate transaction. Uh, that, that fee is usually going to happen anyway. And so for us, uh, it seems to be a great way to, to step in and have have some attractive economics uh, while also uh, keeping the fees low for the investors. It makes sense. Well, I mean, in a world of lower projected returns going forward, then the fees get fees and taxes get oh so important within that return, that total return, right? So how many deals right now do you have coming up new investable deals on your platform? Yeah, we, we aim for a cadence of one a week. Uh, that, that tends to be uh, lumpier than we would we would hope. Uh, just you know, there's there's always contracting um, issues and and lease issues, wh whatever it may be. You know that that last mile uh, getting papered sometimes holds things back. But as, as a general idea, that's that's what we look for. That makes sense. I, and then 
I know neither of us are tax experts, but how is this typically taxed for an individual investing in via a platform like AcreTrader? So you're, you're investing in an LLC. And so it's taxed the same way as any other uh, LLC investment would be, which is uh, the, the, it's passive income every year, but you, you count it as ordinary income. Uh, again, I'm not a tax accountant, uh, insert disclaimers here at the bottom, uh, but, but as, as a general statement, uh, that I, I believe that that's looked at as, as ordinary income. And then the, upon sale, it would be a capital gain. Okay. So each individual investment is structured as a separate LLC through AcreTrader. So that was a little bit more of my next question. You're a young company. Uh, you've been around for for over a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's always a, a thought of, of platform counterparty risk with something like this. So if I make an investment in a farm through Acre Trader, you're just facilitating this deal and I'm actually investing in an LLC that holds this farm. But the worry would be that at the end, a portion of the gain comes from the capital gains at the end. So if Acre Trader goes away, who's responsible for selling the farm at the end of this holding period? How would something like that work? And I'm not implying that you go out of business again. Uh, I, I've been very impressed with Acre Trader and what you guys are doing. I'm just always trying to think through the worst case scenario in these um, sorts of things. I'm happy you asked the question. Uh, and, and yeah, we're not planning on going out of business. We, we just raised a, a large round of funding and got, a, got an incredible team and growth trajectory in front of us. So uh, that, that is definitely not in the cards for us. But in that scenario, uh, we, we have, uh, I, I personally uh, have spent way too much time with, with attorneys in the last few years. And uh, so a lot of that was our, our standardized operating and, and operating agreement and, and investment agreement that surround each of these LLCs. Uh, and, and those are purposely built uh, with, with an investor favorable bend in them uh, around this idea of bankruptcy remoteness or, or, you know, call it what you want. If Acre Trader gets hit by a bus, we have instructions for those LLCs to continue operating uh, and, and continue uh, to uh, seek the same outcome they would otherwise and be administered and managed, et cetera. Is it a, is it a SPAC, special purpose acquisition vehicle? Yeah, each of the LLCs, are, we would probably call it SPV, a special purpose vehicle. Um, so, so similar idea, uh, but it, it's really simple. It's, it's an LLC that holds the title to the land usually. Uh, and, and that's about it. You come in and let's say it's a, you know, just for easy numbers, it's a million dollar piece of land and you invest $20,000. You own 2% of that LLC. And does Acre Trader as a company invest into the deals on your platform as well? The, the company does not. Uh, we, you know, our, our balance sheet would really deploy towards, uh, towards team and, and growth and technology. Uh, as, as individuals, uh, some of us do, some of the management team invest, some of our investors in the company invest in, in deals on the site. So, so absolutely. Nice. And it sounds like you just closed a funding round. Are you able to disclose any details around that? And congrats, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, we, we closed it early March. So it was literally uh, Friday afternoon while we were packing up all of our things in boxes to move home and a, a mad dash around the office to, to get wires crossed and docs signed and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so, so yeah, we got some, some really great investors and great partners in our business. I, I you know, I, a lot of EC funds uh, pride themselves on, on, hey, we're different and we do this for our companies. Um, I, I would say in our case, we, we're incredibly lucky to have true uh, operational stakeholders in our, in our company. Um, and, and so, it, yeah, in, in total round, I mean, we, we raised, you know, five and a half million dollars, something like that, uh, which, which for us is a, a you know, goes a really, really long way. Uh, and so we're, 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 yeah, I just say we're really excited about, uh, about the, the coming years in front of us. Awesome. As you should be. And you, you got the, the round closed right before kind of Corona got a little crazy here. So impeccable timing. Wait, wait, yeah. Uh, look, I'd, I'd rather be lucky than smart every time, I suppose. Absolutely. That's what my dad says, <laughs> playing golf mostly. <laughs> better, better be lucky than good, which also works. What excites you most about Acre Trader going for it? A, a lot. And, and I don't mean to be uh, uh, coy or, or cavalier in, in my answer. Um, I, I think what excites me the most today is the people. Uh, you know, it's just, we have this office full of incredibly hardworking, bright people that are building really cool things. 
uh, and, and doing really cool things every day. And so that's, uh, if, if I boil it all down, that's what I'm most jazzed about every morning when I wake up. It's like, I, I can't wait to see the guys and girls we work with. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but, but I actually really like these people a lot. Uh, and, you know, as I think about impact as, as a company, uh, what, what I'm most excited about is, is growing awareness of this asset class and uh, helping to grow Americans' awareness of where their food comes from and having them play a part in that ecosystem. Uh, and, and uh, you know, ultimately that helping farmers you know, is what, what it really boils down to is if we can help improve liquidity, improve transparency, uh, improve investment in the asset, then we'll be bringing real money to local communities and, uh, and have, a, have a real impact in, in the world of farming, uh, which is uh, often, you know, not very often discussed, uh, but, but quite literally one of the most important things that, that happens in the world. Awesome. Yeah. And, and what major improvements uh, within AcreTrader do you most look forward to uh, in the platform, the offerings, et cetera? That's, that's a good question. Like I'm kind of a tech geek, so I, I, I really uh, in, enjoy some of the technology that our team's been building. Uh, and, and so, you know, on a, on a micro level, uh, you know, of things, if you will, uh, that that's probably it. And, and then, um, you know, the, uh, 10,000 plus registered users we have, I mean, I, I, uh, try to try to speak to people every day that are investors on the platform and, and, or considering being an investor on the platform. And it's, it's, that's really exciting for me. I uh, still, still love those calls and love the criticism we, we hear the, the tough questions we get, uh, cause that, that certainly makes us better. So we, we, we welcome that. You have about 10,000 users on the platform. What, what is the typical mix of bigger players versus individuals investing in your deals? And, and who is the ideal investor that, that you want to reach with AcreTrader? In terms of mix on a, on a uh, people basis, it's much more individual investors, way, way heavier. Uh, in terms of dollars, um, it, it tends to get closer uh, between sort of professional capital and non what is our ideal investor uh, is an educated one, right? Uh, ideally, uh, and we really have these people that have come on the website and read every article we have and, you know, talked to us on the phone multiple times and done their own research. And, um, you know, it's actually pretty awesome to me. We, we've uh, got a friend, Grayson Colvin, who wrote a book on farmland investing and you know, we tell people about it all the time. And when I get that call and the person's like, all right, so I read this book. It's like, Oh my God! You actually you actually sat down and read an entire book about dirt, you know, like in, investing in this boring asset. Uh, that that's awesome, right? And and for us, that that is the ideal investor, someone who knows exactly what they're getting into. They understand the risks, the rewards, and uh, how to ask the hard questions of us. Well, doing things like this, I mean, this helps, right? You're getting out um, a, a lot more information about it, and and I will applaud you guys. You have a lot of good resources on your website. Um, that really helps think through why farmland and why now, which are the, the important things and the risks, obviously. Well, great. Um, how can my listeners find out more, follow you, follow Acre Trader, learn more about what it is you're doing? Sure. We're, we're out there. So you know, Google Acre Trader. We, we got LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook pages and uh, um, you know, great following on each of those platforms. But uh, what, what we really like is people to come on acretrader.com and uh, come, come read through it and send us a chat or an email info at acre trader. Uh, give us a call. Uh, we, 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 we really enjoy the conversation I think is, is what it comes down to. That's, that's all we do is talk about farmland. Awesome. Anything else you want to leave uh, my listeners with? No, Ben, I, 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 you know, really appreciate the the questions today. It's been a, been an awesome conversation and I've enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, I, I think we've hit the high points of why we as a company are excited about farmland investing and, and I uh, hope your listeners uh, share that sentiment. Awesome. Well, really appreciate it, Carter. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you. There you have it. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. Show notes, transcript, links, and more can be found on our website at altassetallocation.com. If you'd be so kind, please share this with anyone you think might be interested or get some value from this conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. I'm always happy to hear them. 
Lastly, if you're on YouTube, please like the video or subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please subscribe to the podcast and or leave a review. This really helps more people find the podcast and I really appreciate it. Thanks again and hope you have a fantastic day. Happy investing.